Uh, let me just check. You can hear my voice clearly? Yeah? Okay. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. I hardly recognize myself. As you can, uh, first of all, it's very nice to be back in Indonesia. Um, I used to visit Indonesia a lot in the late 1980s, and I probably visited a lot of different towns. Um, Yogyakarta, Surabaya, Jakarta, Palembang, Medan, Padang. Oh, so hot food in Padang. Yeah? Um, Bengkulu. So a lot of places that I visited. But I haven't been visiting so regularly, so recently, so it's really a pleasure to be back in Indonesia. Thank you for inviting me. You can see I'm going to talk about oral corrective feedback in language pedagogy and in second language acquisition research, SLA. So what is corrective feedback? And here is my definition of it. Corrective feedback takes the form of responses to learner utterances that contain or are perceived as containing an error. And corrective feedback occurs in what are called reactive focus on form episodes, and these consist of a trigger, a feedback move, and optionally, uptake. And so you can see what I mean by that. Here is an example. So a student says, I went to the train station and pick up my arms. And you can see that there's an error there. Can you see there's an error there? To help you spot it, I put the error in bold, yeah? Should be past tense. So that is the trigger. That's what triggers the corrective feedback. And the teacher then provides feedback in the form of a little metalinguistic comment, hey, use past tense consistently. And then the student does uptake the correction by self-correcting. I went to the train station and picked up my heart. So that's an example of the kind of corrective feedback that I'm going to be talking about. Now, I don't know how much research you read, I don't know how many books on language teaching you read, but one thing is quite certain, and that is that corrective feedback receives a lot of attention. It receives attention in language pedagogy, partly because of the importance that is attached to grammatical correctness, and it also receives a lot of interest from second language acquisition researchers, partly because they're interested in what they call the role of negative evidence. So negative evidence is when a learner is corrected. They are receiving negative evidence that something they said is not correct. Negative evidence. And also, this negative evidence may lead to them self-correcting, which is what pushed output is, where the learner self-corrects. So, corrective feedback is what I call an interface issue. And it's these interface issues that I have become particularly interested in in the last few years. An interface issue is an issue that is highly important for language pedagogy, but also of real interest for researchers investigating the learning of a second language, second language acquisition. So there's an interface between the interests of teachers doing corrective feedback and the interest of researchers wanting to research their theories of second language acquisition. So the way I'm going to handle this talk is like this. I'm going to start with what is typically said about language pedagogy, uh, it's what is typically said about corrective feedback in language pedagogy. What are the pedagogical positions that we find in books written to guide teachers in their teaching, etc. Then I want to move towards second language acquisition researchers have had to say 
And then right at the end, I want to go back and look at the differences between the typical pedagogical positions and what second language acquisition research is saying. Well, one way in which we can investigate pedagogical positions is by looking at what I call teacher guides. And teacher guides are books that are written to guide teachers into how to teach. They are books that give advice about how to teach. And I put here some of the most popular uh, books. You can see Learning Teaching by Jim Scrivener, English Language Teaching by Jeremy Palmer, Task-Based Teaching by David Noonan, and A Course in Language uh, Teaching by Penny Year. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I've gone through these books in order to see what they have to say about corrective feedback. Well, actually, what they all say is that it's positive feedback that is important, not corrective feedback. Positive feedback is when you say, great, yes, good, that's right, etc. Well done, giving positive feedback. And these teacher guides emphasize the importance of positive feedback. Newton says that it helps to let students know that they perform correctly, but also it increases through motivation through praise. And Penny Yeur points out that correcting students can be potentially dangerous because it may make them feel bad and therefore they will become less receptive to learning. And she argues it needs to be given in an atmosphere of support and warm solidarity. However, not all educationalists actually agree that providing lots of positive evidence is always a good thing. In fact, there is increasingly the feeling that providing lots of positive evidence doesn't do that much for language learning, right? There are five central questions that these guides address in one way or another about the role of corrective feedback. Should learners' errors be corrected? Or should we just ignore them? When should learners' errors be corrected? Which errors should be corrected? How should we correct them? And who should do the correcting? Should it be the teacher, student, or another student who didn't make the error? These are the kinds of issues involved here. So starting with should learner errors be corrected, if we look at a number of methods of language teaching, past and present, we can see in fact that there are very different views about whether learners' errors should be corrected or not. So you take out your lingualism, this is a sort of pattern practice, drill and die method. Um, by and large, negative assessment plays little role in that because the idea is to prevent learners making errors not to let them make errors and then correct them. Humanistic methods, these are methods that involve caring and sharing with your students. They argue that assessment should be positive and non-judgmental. In other words, no corrective feedback. Skill learning approaches, approaches which probably this is the approach that really dominates current textbook writing, with sort of PPP, present, practice, produce, and feedback has a clear role to play in skill learning theory. One thing that comes out of these teacher guides is the advice that when you are doing a communicative task to try to develop learners fluency, their ability to speak with confidence, their ability to speak fluently, then you should not actually correct during the actual uh, fluency activity. Because if you correct during the fluency activity, it will interfere with the students, prevent their, their, them using the language fluently, etc. So one view that is a very common pedagogical view is that correcting errors should largely be restricted to accuracy work, right? Not fluency work. When should learning errors be corrected? Well, teachers obviously have an option. They can either correct 
immediately an error occurs, as soon as it occurs, or they can make a little note of the error that students made, and then at the end of the activity, they can go over those particular errors. So in other words, corrective feedback can be immediate, as soon as the learner made the error, or it can be delayed until the end of the fluency activity. And the guides seem to come out pretty firmly in favor of, um, in favor of delayed feedback rather than immediate feedback, particularly in fluency activities. Which error should be corrected? Penny Earth says, learners can only use just so much feedback information. To give too much may simply distract, discourage, and actually detract from the value of learning. Right? And Katayama also argues for selective correction. So the position that's been taken here is that teachers should not try to correct all the errors that students make. They should be selective. Well, if they're going to be selective, the question arises, on what basis do I decide what errors to correct and which errors to ignore? And various proposals have been put forward here. A very early one was put forward by Pitt Corder, and he said correct errors but not mistakes. An error is when you really don't know what is correct. The mistake is when you know what is correct, but you still make a mistake. You still get it wrong. And Corder says, well, forget correcting mistakes because learners really know what it is and focus instead on errors. Bird suggested collect, correct global errors, that is to say errors that interfere with communication, as opposed to local errors which don't. So an example of a local error would be third person S, when someone says something like, my father lived in Jakarta, rather than my father lives in Jakarta. It doesn't interfere with meaning, and if it doesn't interfere with meaning, why bother correcting? That's the position that Bert takes. Krashen says that the only value of corrective feedback, which he doesn't like at all, really, but if you're going to do it, he says it has to be with very simple features. We can't correct very complex grammatical features because learners won't be able to really process the correction. And another is to correct persistent errors rather than occasional errors. So all these are, if you like, advice as to how to go about selecting which errors to correct or which ones aren't. But none of these proposals are actually easy to implement. For example, how do you know if a learner says something that is not grammatical, how do you know whether it's an error or a mistake? And if you can't tell whether it's an error or a mistake, then that distinction is not going to help you to make selection. How should errors be corrected? All the guides talk at length about different ways of correcting errors, and what they do is simply to list different ways of doing the corrections. And this is a list taken from the teacher guides. Questioning the learner, direct indication, requesting clarification, requesting repetition, echoing, right? These are the strategies that are recommended in the teacher guides. But the guides only provide lists. They don't make any attempt to try to classify the strategies, to show you the difference between the different strategies and how the different strategies might work to help learners learn. They don't do that. And interestingly, they don't provide any examples whatsoever of the actual correcting strategies. They just describe them with no examples. So what the guides do advise about how to correct is to use a variety of strategies. And to use strategies that require learners to correct their own errors. So some strategies provide the learner with the correction and other strategies push the learner to self-correct. And the guides have a clear preference for strategies that push learners to self-correct. To give you an example, 
the learner says, last weekend I go see movie, and the teacher says, sorry, what was that? And pushes the learner to self-correct. Last weekend I went to see a 